from the Da Vinci Code to the Bible Code, there's always been mystery surrounding hidden messages in some historical articles. But are these codes real or just a great way of getting to the top of the bestsellers list? Well, luckily, we have mathematician Brendan McKay with us here today to help us sort it out. G'day, Brendan. How are you? Hi, John. Now, first of all, what are these codes and are they real? Well, that's a good question. The, <laughs> the claim is that if you analyse the text of the Bible in the original language, which is Hebrew, and use a computer in a particular way, you can detect hidden messages I inside it concerning the future. Uh -huh. And uh, so the people who put these messages in, obviously, they didn't have computers when they were putting them in. So they obviously have their own weird system for doing it. But you need a computer to work it out. Right. Okay. And so what were they saying and are they real? Well, there's a number of different claims. One of the claims is that there are messages concerning the current time and things that might happen, uh, earthquakes, uh, assassinations, future calamities that right. await mankind. So these are quite specific things that they say. Yeah. Places, times, dates, details, yes. So have any of these things actually happened? No. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing. These things actually haven't happened. Well, you know, it depends exactly what you mean because after the thing actually happened, you can go back and find the prediction there. Ah. But did you find it before it actually happened or only after? This is an important point to make. Well, and so how do you apply your particular branch of maths to studying these codes and finding out if they're real or not or what's going on? Well, it's a question of probability in statistics. Uh, we know that when things are truly random, still we find some order within them. For example, you can look at clouds and every cloud, well, most clouds just look like a random clump of stuff with no particular shape, but every so often you'll see one that looks like a face or an elephant or something like that. Yeah. And unless you're particularly superstitious, you understand that this is simply that random chance occasionally produces something that we humans regard as being non-random. So, th so this is, is, is this the human condition which is constantly searching for meaning and in, in generally in meaning, a yes. random universe? And it, it seems like our brains are designed to detect patterns. Mm. And so we're so good at detecting patterns that we often detect patterns when there really aren't any. So your study of these codes, what did it show in the end? Did it show that it was really just a whole lot of random stuff and you could just make predictions up pretty much? Or? Well, there's... I divide the claims into two types. One is the anecdotal type, mm. and this is when people show in the Bible apparently predictions of JFK's assassination or the earthquake in Kobe City in Japan and things like this. Mm. And these are not really scientific claims because they don't come along with some sort of criterion for proof. They just say, look at this, it's amazing. Isn't it really wonderful? You should believe it because mm. it's obviously so amazing. And the way to counter things like that is just to pick up an arbitrary book. My favourite book is Moby Dick <laughs> <laughs> and feed that into the computer and then find the same type of things in Moby Dick. So what have, what have you found in Moby Dick? Oh, I can find anything you like, basically. Is I've that right? I found the same set of assassinations and predictions of the future and, you know, the Bali bombing is one of my best successes. It's, oh, it's detected the name of the place where it happened and, you know, everything, oh basically the detail you can find. Mm. And basically what's going on there is that the computer is so fast and it can look at the text in so many billions of different ways that even though most of the time it looks it just sees random junk, mm. every so often that small probability is there that there's something that appears to be non-random and eventually a computer will find it. Yes. And yes. then you, you show the, your audience just this finding and then you don't show them the billion other things that were just junk at the same time that it threw and up. they don't realise that you're really just looking at a needle in a haystack. So. When you started your mathematics career, did you think that you might end up doing things like, you know, debunking uh, uh, conspiracy theories, or, or did you was was your mathematics quite a uh, a one area type of um, field when you first started? Did you see all those possibilities? 
I have actually been interested in similar sorts of things since I was a student in the 1970s. And even though none of the claims around then were quite as amazing as the claims that exist now, they were still of mathematical interest. Mm. So, for example, there's a thing called Bible numerics, where people do stuff like counting letters and words and sentences and things in the Bible, and then they find numerical patterns yeah. in these counts. Mm -hmm. And then they further claim to be calculating probabilities that these counts occurred by chance, and they find the probabilities are extremely small, you know, one in a billion type of thing, and therefore it must have occurred deliberately according to their argument. And so as a student who was interested in probability, this argument interested me and I spent quite a bit of time investigating it and looking for my own examples in texts other than the Bible and calculating probabilities correctly and just thinking about the, the whole issue of what it means to have a small probability. And how do you, so how do you, so you work with probability? Yes. How does that apply to, I guess, more applied um, uh, situations other than debunking myths? Do you apply it to, to modelling certain groups of, 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 of animals or how do you apply your maths in general? Well, I'm interested in the mathematics of coincidences. You know, you go overseas and you bump into the person who lives next door in a strange place and everybody in, in their experience every so often has something which strikes them as a remarkable coincidence. And one would like to know is this something that's quite consistent with the normal laws of chance or is it something sort of more spooky going on that these things happen more often than they should? Mm. And it's actually quite an interesting question from both the psychological point of view and from the probability theory point of view. Uh, from the probability point of view, the thing is that we're always looking for coincidences, but our mind is open as to what the coincidences are. So it's not that you might meet your neighbour in a foreign country and um, think that's amazing, but you're just finding one of a very large number, million different possibilities for the coincidence. And you know, it didn't have to be your neighbour, it could have been somebody you knew at high school or it could have been that you didn't meet them in this strange place, you met them in a strange circumstance or it could have been an entirely different type of coincidence which I can't even think of at the moment. But your mind is open to these coincidences and there's so many millions of different things that you would regard as remarkable. Each one occurs with a very low probability but there's so many of them that altogether there's a reasonably good chance that one of them is going to happen and when that one happens, you forget all the others. Yeah. And you just focus your mind on this single thing and it appears to be extremely unlikely. So you, can you work out the probability of bumping into an old friend when you're overseas? Uh, I guess you could. I haven't really yeah. put my mind to that. <laughs> so what other things do you use this sort of um, calculation for? Well, from my mathematical point of view, I'm interested in the, the growth of random structures. Uh, an example of that is the internet where we have this huge network of computers that are connected to each other and all the time computers are leaving or joining and they're joining not entirely at random but with some randomness involved. So one would have to, you'd like to ask the question for example, can you form a mathematical model of the growth of the internet so that over time say over the next decade, you can predict what the shape's going to be like and you can predict things like how distant are two nodes chosen at random on the internet, are they getting further apart or the connectivity increasing so that in fact they're getting closer together and questions like that. And so why would you want to know? Why would, why would that be helpful to predict the, the growth of the internet? Well, it's a little bit outside my area, but somebody who's interested in the electronics of making the internet, you know, secure and fast and usable and more mm. efficient and so on, needs to know these things in order to design 
what types of hardware are required and what types of protocols for exchanging information are going to be efficient into the future. So if they can pre-guess which way it's going to go, they can kind of make the right yes. preparations. So That's that, right. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. But I'm, I'm using the internet as just one example. There's very many. Even the problem of bringing people together and asking them to make some decision jointly as a committee is an example of a sort of random structure. And as they discuss with each other and they form one opinion and then they change it to another opinion and so on, you have this sort of thing going on which is the behaviour of a random system. So it's always like you're looking at equations which can kind of um, describe human behaviour. Is that going a bit too far with it? Mm, it's, it's always the question with, with mathematics that the equations never correspond precisely to the reality. Mm. You know, we do not understand human psychology well enough that we can write down some equations and perfectly describe it. But we can try to make a mathematical system of equations whose behaviour is at least similar to the behaviour of, say, a set of humans or a set of computers on the internet. And this is called a mathematical model. And the mathematical model never corresponds exactly to the real system, but we try to do it so that it seems to be a reasonable approximation. And the, way, the reason why we make the mathematical model is because then we can change the parameters. You know, we can add more people or something like that. We can do it all on the computer or even just on a piece of paper. And if the model is a reasonably good one, then it will give us some insight into what the real system, the real set of humans or something might do. You know, what happens when the committee becomes twice as big? Do they reach a decision faster or more securely? Or, you know, I'm just making this up, but yeah. that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, so you get guidelines, you get information about the best way to do things, I guess. Yes. Once again, making things more efficient. Exactly. Do you think it's a good time to be a math mathematician now? Oh, the world is just full of interesting problems that can be described by mathematics, yes. Do you think there's more of a, more of a convergence of maths sort of cross-fertilising into more areas of, of other disciplines but which related, like physics or biology or...? All of these areas have become extremely mathematical in their core foundations. So even though some people doing biology might never touch an equation, there are definitely others who are really mathematicians working in the biology department and their basic method of operating is to model the biological system using mathematics and to make deductions from that. So your people are infiltrating everywhere. <laughs> I guess <laughs> you could say that. That's what they're taking it over. <laughs> if you had um, um, a piece of advice to give to a young budding mathematician, what would it be? Someone who might be interested in maths was there anything you'd, you'd, you'd offer up as a Philip of good advice? <laughs> you got a good one there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything? I, I think one should keep your mind open about applications. Mathematics occurs everywhere and the you never know when you're studying a particular abstract piece of mathematics how it's going to be applied. So in my career, even though I regard myself as a pure mathematician, that means basically I study mathematics for the sake of the mathematics. I'm constantly amazed at the phone calls I get from somebody in physics or in psychology or something saying, you know, what you did in that paper you just published is exactly what I need to do something concerning my protein molecules here. And this type of thing just happens over and over again. It is really quite amazing how abstract mathematics seems to just beg itself into other fields of study. And that's quite amazing. Yes. Even the, the probability of that amazes you. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yes. And we don't really why understand why that is. The universe seems to be very mathematical in its core foundation. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a difficult question as to why that might be the case. But it does seem to be so. So you love mathematics? I certainly do, yes. Well, thank you very much for talking to us today, Brendan. Really thank appreciate you. it. <laughs>